right, the first thing we're going to do is model customer retention. But first, just to kind of get our bearings with the assumptions that we're making here. Now, we're working with a subscription firm. We're assuming that customers are acquired at the end of each quarter, uh, and they get revenue each quarter. So this is basically saying that 56.4 million customers were acquired in the third quarter. And as we move uh, along each row, uh, this represents the number of customers who are still alive from within each acquisition cohort. So if we were to sum the number of customers that were alive across all of the acquisition cohorts within a particular quarterly slice of time, this must be equal to the total number of customers that are alive in the period, which is what's being shown over here. And then finally, this represents the total amount of revenues uh, that's being generated by kind of by time point, by quarter in this case. So we're conditioning on the acquisitions process. And the main thing we want to model is the retention of customers after they've been acquired. So remember, we've got our SPG model. Uh, we learned that very early on. And what we're going to do is we're going to have separate uh, SPG models for each acquisition cohort. So cohort one is born. They get their own SPG uh, with parameters gamma and delta. Cohort number two is born, they get their own parameters, and so on and so forth. So we're going to kind of have cohort-specific parameters for each of these cohorts until we get to cohorts that are on the young side. So at some point, and there's no rule for this, we're going to probably have to basically start lumping customers together. And so what I'm assuming here is, if you're in cohorts five, six, seven, or eight, you all share the same parameters. And so all of these other cohorts are simply referencing the parameters of the cohort that precedes it. And the way that we're going to estimate these parameters is uh, by minimizing the sum of the squared error uh, off of all of the data associated with all of these cohorts. And so that's the magic, that if you were to take cohort number seven, for example, we don't have uh, any more than a single retention data point. So there's no way we could even identify a two-parameter model. But by lumping all of these customers into the same one cohort, it's going to, to stabilize our estimates, uh, even for cohorts that are on the younger side. So you give me the SPG, I can give you the probability of churn uh, by a cohort over time, that's what we see over here, using the formula that we learned before. And then using that data, I can convert that into the estimated proportion of each cohort that's alive in future periods, which is what we see over here. Now, because I know that, you know, say 50 million customers were acquired in cohort number one, and I know that 61.9% of those customers are still with the firm uh, by calendar quarter number six, <clears throat> then the number of customers that are alive in uh, quarter number six is simply that 50 million that I started with multiplied by the 61.9 percent. So again, the sum of the squared error is just the sum of the squared differences between what I expect the C3 to be, which is what this represents over here, and the actual C3 uh, as shown over here. So again, we're going cohort by cohort, so when I estimate the parameters for cohort number one. Let's just kind of default this to one. What I'm going to do to estimate cohort number one's parameters is I'm going to go to the data, go to solver. I am then going to go to minimize the sum of the squared error associated with the first cohort by changing these two parameters. These constraints are simply to enforce that all of these gamma delta parameters are, are strictly positive. So I hit solver, it solves, that gives me the parameters for cohort one. I repeat that for all of the other cohorts in exactly the same way. I minimize SSC2 to estimate the parameters of the second cohort. I minimize SSC3 estimate the parameters of cohort 3, do that for cohort number 4, and then finally 
again I'm going to estimate the parameters that are associated with all the future cohorts 5, 6, 7, and 8 by minimizing the sum of the squared error associated with cohorts 5, 6, 7, and 8 which is shown over here which is just the sum of these four by changing these two parameters over here and we go so now this is my expected C3 and it's going to be remarkably close to the actual C3 and just to kind of make this perfectly clear let's go to cohort number three let's just compare actual versus expected we can hardly see the difference which is good <laughs>